Thank you, David. And David, thank you to the Democratic Forum for hosting this event tonight. Uh, I asked one of my aides to look at how many health care meetings I had had over the last month and a half to two months. I am now well over 50. Um, and I have met with individuals all across various institutions. I have met with doctors and nurses. I have met with small business owners and large business owners. Uh, I have met with hospital administrators. I have met with uh, home care providers. And I have met with Republicans and Democrats. I've been invited to the Republican, uh, Republican Forum as well. I have gladly accepted. Um, and so I have worked hard to spend as much time as I can learning, quite frankly, uh, from my constituents, uh, their feelings about the health care reform that, that is being considered in the House, and also share with them some of the parameters that are currently being discussed. Uh, I was one of the members, and, and I think David is right in that there are people here on the left that aren't happy with what's being considered in Congress, there are people on the right that aren't, being considered, uh, aren't happy with what's being considered in Congress. I was not happy with the idea that we would take a vote on this bill by the end of July. Uh, the bill, as you may or may not know, was introduced about three weeks prior to our recess, and I was one of several members that approached the Speaker and said, I don't want to vote on this, and I'm not going to vote on this now, and if you force a vote, I will vote no. Um, I realize some Democrats don't want to hear that, However, uh, I think it was the right thing to do. Because while we have had in Congress uh, probably hundreds of meetings on health care over the years, and certainly all of the committees that have jurisdiction have had multiple hearings on the issues just during this session of Congress, the fact of the matter is the American people didn't have an opportunity to get their arms around this bill, you know, in the three weeks between the time it was introduced and when we went on recess. So, I, I am happy that we took the time. Uh, I can tell you there was a lot of angst in Congress uh, because many of the Democrats wanted to move forward, saying we have the momentum, we've got the votes, let's pass this thing. It seems to me that what's more important than passing whatever bill it is uh, at the end of July is trying to get it right. And, and so I am committed to, to working on issues and, and trying to get this as right as I can influence. Um, just some general observations and a few comments about the bill. I have learned uh, in my travels around the district and talking to business owners that the cost of health care is putting some of them out of business, that more and more small businesses uh, in Cincinnati and in Ohio are either cutting back on benefits or dropping health care altogether. It's now estimated that only about 50% of Ohio's small businesses offer health care. The fastest growing population amongst the uninsured is working. It is the working poor. And, and it's people who are working, especially for small businesses, who lose their benefits and then have to go out onto the private marketplace and try to get an individual plan for their families. That is a very, very expensive proposition. And far too many families, when they look at that, say, look, we just can't afford this. Given the prices of everything else, we simply can't afford this. And so they're going without. I think that's a, a very real problem. Another growing cause uh, of those that are uninsured in the United States is this notion that people with pre-existing conditions can't buy any plan at any reasonable cost. It was interesting, I, and I told this story the other night at a forum. I was out in the Western Hills visiting a business, very successful business, a few guys that happened to go to my high school, uh, started a business, and, and they're doing well. They told me they don't want government to have anything to do with uh, their health care. And then I asked them, so how are things? Tell me a little bit about your health care. They said, well, it's funny you should ask, because you know our broker was just in here yesterday going through the numbers with us. And it looks like we're going to have a 30% increase. A 30% increase. And I said, well, how do you manage that? Why a 30% increase? That certainly inflation isn't causing a 30% increase. And they said, no, one of the partners uh, has a daughter that's sick. She has a condition that needs significant treatment. And because of that, they now have to dramatically cut back on benefits for everybody else. 
That's just the reality of what people are facing. But it's interesting because I also learned in talking to a lot of people that just because you're insured doesn't mean we're getting primary care. Um, it's not enough just to insure everybody. What we need to do is create a better healthcare system in the United States. There are or another when they're covered by Medicaid or covered by private insurance, choose not to avail themselves of primary care. We can't continue down that road. We need to work on preventative care. We need to work on wellness. We need to incentivize preventative care and wellness. I've also learned in talking to a lot of physicians, a lot of hospitals, that the fee-for-service model is broken. Because the fee-for-service model doesn't incentivize wellness. The fee-for-service model doesn't incentivize preventative care. What the fee-for-service model does is it pays for procedures. Well, there are a whole host of reasons why too many procedures are being used in, in some circumstances. And when you look at the various models, and I learned a lot when I was just at the Children's Hospital the other day, talking about fee-for-service and evidence-based medicine, that it makes all the sense in the world to try to provide more holistic care for our patients and to pay for the care of those individuals than it does to pay for each treatment. This is the model that is being used by the Cleveland Clinic. This is the model being used by the Mayo Clinic. And it's really about creating a medical home for individuals in the United States. But in order to achieve that, you have to have portability. And right now, we also don't have portability in our healthcare system. That is because it's linked to your job. If you lose your job, you can't keep the health, same health insurance you know, when you go on to your next job. And God forbid you have someone in your family with a pre-existing condition or your spouse happens to be pregnant, because that's often seen as a pre-existing condition. And that further drives up your costs. So we have a tremendous number of challenges in our current system. And I don't believe the current model is sustainable for many of our businesses and way too many of our families.